Welcome to a special bonus episode of Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning. I'm Tom Orr. You're going to hear today from a man with some connections to both sides of this weekend's enormous number two versus number three matchup between the Ohio State Buckeyes and the Oregon Ducks. That is Ohio State offensive coordinator Chip Kelly. Kelly spent two seasons seasons as an assistant for the Ducks under Mike Bellotti, and then four seasons as their head coach, going 46 and 7, and including a Rose Bowl win, a Fiesta Bowl win, and finishing third, fourth, and second, respectively, in his final three seasons in the AP poll. Pretty remarkable run for Chip Kelly out at Oregon. Now he's the offensive coordinator for Ryan Day and the Ohio State Buckeyes. But how special is it going to be for Chip Kelly to go back to the program he helped build? Yeah, well, I didn't build a program. Rich Books and Mike Bellotti built the program. Um, I just kind of jumped in after Mike, but it's a special place. And I think it's it's great for our players, you know, a chance for them to play in one of the special places in, in college football. And, you know, they came out here a couple years ago and got to play in the shoe. Um, we get to go play in Autzen Stadium, and it's Autzen Stadium at that time of day. It's it's truly special. So I think our guys are excited. They're a really good team. You know, and I think that that'll that'll get your attention right away when you look at the film. And then I have, you know, family there. I have a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law and three nephews. So I'll get a chance to see them. And then some of the coaches that I've coached with, Nick Eliotti, John Neal, Don Pelham, Steve Greatwood, a couple guys we've text messaged. So um, besides family and those coaches that I worked with um, that I'll get a chance to see very quickly, um, it's about the game. You know, and it's I'm fired up for our players because it is a really special place to play. Chip Kelly was part of a lot of high-flying, high-scoring offenses during his days out in Eugene, but it being high-flying and or high-scoring this weekend, that's going to be a challenge because the Oregon Duck defense is pretty darn good. So what stands out about the Ducks on defense? I think the way Jordan Birch is playing right now up front, um, you know, they've got a lot of seniors on their defense. I think there's nine of them in that starting lineup. You know, everybody in the back end, the two linebackers, uh, the one linebacker, Bassa seems like he's been there for a long time. And then Betcher, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, number 28, who's a really good player, uh, baseball player, has played really, really well. It kind of seems like he's the heart and soul of that defense. And then they have veterans in the secondary. They're all, I know they're transfer kids, but they're all seniors that have played a lot of football. So um, I think they're really gelling together as a group. You know, they're going to present a lot of different looks. Um, so we've got to be ready for everything they can throw at you, and they're going to throw a lot of things at you. So, you know, that's that's the challenge when you're going to play a team like this. So, so you get excited about it. Since Kelly arrived in Columbus, it has coincided with a remarkable increase in the efficiency of the Buckeyes in the red zone. Why have they been so successful in the red zone this season? I think our players are just executing, you know, and the, 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 I would attribute it to our players. I think they <clears throat> really grasp the plan each week, and the plan is different because we play different people on a weekly basis. Um, but they've really executed, and it, and it starts in our practice sessions. I think they've been really sharp. You know, this group really practices really, really well. Um, you know, so kind of what we've done in practice on Wednesdays and Thursdays, which is our red zone days, they've gone out and executed at a really high level. I thought our receivers have caught the ball really well down there. And I thought Will's located the ball down there when we've had to throw it. Um, but you have to run the ball in there. And I think our the way our offensive line's playing and our tight ends are playing and we get into some of those bigger sets have provided us, you know, uh, the ability to, to either run it in or throw it in right now. So just to be clear, Chip Kelly is not taking any credit for himself here? Yeah, it's always the players. You know, they have to execute. I mean, you can call a play, but they still have to go out and execute that play. And um, I think that's what we got. We've got a bunch of guys that spend a lot of time. They, this group works extremely hard at the game. You know, and they take everything we do. They're really serious about it. So when you watch our red zone practices on Wednesday and Thursday, um, that's really the reason we're successful on, on Saturdays is because of how they train and how they prepare on Wednesdays and Thursdays for, for those scenarios that will come up in a game. Chip Kelly and Brian Day go way back to their shared hometown of Manchester, New Hampshire, way back when, before Day was even a college quarterback. So all those shared experiences with Ryan Day over the years, how does that impact their relationship with him coaching together now? Yeah, I, th I'm, I just think we've been around each other for so long that um, we share a lot of the same views of how the game is supposed to look, you know, so it's when he has an idea, it's not something that you're like, wow, where did that come from? You know, you have, you have an understanding because we spent time together coaching together and and I coached, coached him, but then I also got to coach with him. So, you know, I think we, we shared experience. Sometimes he'll talk about a route that we may have run when we were together in the NFL. Remember when we played the Cowboys and we did it this way, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, let's get that tape out. Let's take a look at that. So um, I think our familiarity in, in understanding how we see the game, when we see the game similar, that uh, I think that makes it so much easier. Kelly served as Day's coach. Kelly served as Day's boss. 
And now Day is Kelly's boss. So what has it been like for Chip Kelly to work with Ryan Day? It's been great. I mean, it's it's all about what we really care about. It's about football. And um, he gets pulled out of some meetings sometimes. And obviously, that's what happens to a head coach. You know, there are, there are other things on his plate besides just the offense. And the fact that I can stay in there with Brian Hartline and Justin Fry and Carlos Lachlan and Keenan Bailey, you know, um, we'll, we'll continue to grind on what we got to do. And then when he comes back in, we kind of present what we came up with. And most of the time, we're all we're always on the same page. Or, you know, it's, hey, did you look, why don't you look at a little bit like this? And then they can kind of give you a new idea and you can you can get some a little bit more traction doing it that way. But I think we <clears throat> we understand we're both of our backgrounds. So I think um, that's what makes it so easy to for for us to have conversations about it. Back to the Oregon defense now. And the Ducks have a number of difference makers, chief among them, Jordan Birch, two and a half sacks last week against Michigan State. What makes Jordan Birch so special as a defensive end? Yeah, I think his athletic ability for such a big player, you know, he's listed at 6'5", 290, um, but he plays defensive end. Most guys that big are the interior defensive linemen, you know, so he... Um, He's got. He's a really athletic guy, and you know he he had a, a huge game against Michigan State last Friday night, you know, and really kind of showed up. I think he's he's really starting to embrace that role <clears throat> that uh, Tosh and and Dan are, are have put him in, and um, you know you, you got to know where he is on every play. But he's a, he's one of those guys that can disrupt the football game. Austin Stadium is a place where it's renowned as one of the loudest places to play and hardest places to play in college football. Oregon, the top team in the nation over the last few years in terms of home winning percentage. Chip Kelly obviously has played more than a few games there in Autzen Stadium and in Eugene. So what's he going to tell the Buckeyes about going into Autzen Stadium? Yeah, I think it's like any advice you give anybody is that it's really not about the crowd. You know, it's about what do we do and how do we prepare? Um, you know, it's, I think everywhere you go in this league, it's, it's going to be loud. You know, that's just the nature of it. The, the stadiums in the Midwest are gigantic, you know, and I think this group has got a lot, have had a lot of experience playing in big stadiums. So, you know, I think no matter where we were going, whether it was up to Otson or to the big house or, or up to Camp Randall or any place like that in between is that you really don't concentrate on the stadium. You're really concentrating on the opponent and, and it, you just turn the tape on and that will have your attention. You, you know, it's, it's about the, Ohio State football players versus the Oregon football players. And it's it's not about the environment that you're playing in. It's about the game itself. So, One of the things that has really kept the Ohio State offense churning this year is the dynamic duo of Quinshawn Judkins and Travion Henderson at running back. So what has Chip Kelly learned so far about Quinshawn Judkins now that he's been able to see him play during game? I've I had just seen highlights because obviously – you know, we didn't we weren't in the same league and didn't play them. So, you know, I'd see highlights on a Saturday and knew he was really talented, knew he had run for a lot of yards there. Um, came from a really well coached scheme. Lane does a great job and did a great job with him. But, you know, I, I think seeing his physicality, because normally, you know, we're not tackling and taking guys down in practice. So, you know, we're usually just studying the running back up and the running back has to give a little bit because he's not trying to run over a defensive player because the defensive player is not trying to tackle him. So, you know, when in, in and when you really see him live in games and see here comes an unblocked guy, you know, and, you know, I, I look back to the Marshall game where the linebacker was unblocked and he just kind of tossed him to the ground. You know, I think it's his physicality running with the football. Um, not that I didn't think he had it. It's just, I, I, I wasn't, I'd never seen him in those situations before. So um, he, he's got really good vision and he's got great feet for a big player. You know, he's 220 pounds. And, you know, I had noticed that right at the beginning because when we're doing run throughs and things like that, you watch him navigate and make a decision on where he's going through a hole. And then when he sticks his foot in the ground, he takes off. But then I think when you see him in games, like you guys have seen him in games. And for us, it's the really the first five times I've seen him have been the same five times you guys have seen him in a game. And it's his physicality when he has the ball in his hands that I think kind of can separate him from some other backs. The Ohio State offense has had a whole lot of success this year and very few failures sprinkled in here and there. One of them was a failed fourth down attempt last weekend when Will Howard was trying to keep it and just got stuffed in the backfield. What happened on that play and does that impact the decision making on fourth downs moving forward? No, I think every game is different. So how people defend certain things, it's, um, you know, sometimes you got to give credit to them. I think they did a decent job with penetration, you know, and kind of reestablishing the line of scrimmage there a little bit. So um, we couldn't stay on track in terms of the path that we wanted to start the quarterback on. And really, it was just a little bit of knockback that affected us on that. But when it's fourth and two, a little bit of knockback can affect you. This will not be the first time that Chip Kelly and Dan Lanning go head to head. The two faced off when Kelly was still the head coach at UCLA, and the Bruins had a statistically pretty good day. So what is it that he liked about going up against that landing defense, and what did he learn from that experience? 
I can start with that I didn't like is that we were behind, so we threw the ball a lot more in that game because we were behind. And that's, you know, sometimes I think if you just look at the statistics of a game and say, hey, you guys had X amount of offense, well, are they playing the same defense that they would play if it was a little bit closer score? And I don't know if that's the case when you go back and look at that game. You know, we, we, we faced a lot of soft zones in the second half because we were down, so we had to throw the ball. Um, to try to get within a score or two, you know, when we kind of made it a little bit closer at the end. So, um, you know, they're really well coached. He's, he comes from a, a really good coaching tree, starting with Coach Saban and Kirby at both Alabama and Georgia. So, um, you know, they're going to be sound. Um, they're going to move their front. You know, um, they play very, very close in coverage. They're very sticky in their coverage in terms of challenging your receivers. Um, and there's a lot on the plates of the linebackers, and I, but I think their linebackers are really well coached, and I think they handle it really well. This was an interesting question. Kelly got his first head coaching job at the University of Oregon. So how did his time there impact his philosophy as a coach? Well, I had a chance to work for a great head coach in Mike Bellotti's when I was there for two years as an assistant. But more important than that, I think Mike's staff was together a lot of those guys for 20 plus years, which was even a rarity back then. You know, Gary Campbell, when Gary retired at running back coach, he had been there for 30 some odd years. Nick Aliotti was 20 plus years. Steve Greatwood was 20 plus years. John Neal, 15 years. Tom Osborne, 15 years. Don Pelham, 20 plus years. So I came in and I was the youngest guy there in the least amount of time on staff, but there was such a wealth of knowledge from that coaching staff that you couldn't help but but learn from those guys. And it was um, and they welcomed me. They welcomed me with open arms. So it was just a really cool experience for me to spend three years as an assistant before I became a head coach. And then when I became a head coach, those guys were all there with me. So it was like I had five or six other head coaches with me that kind of shepherded me along the way as we kept going. But um, the big thing there is that we had great players. You know, and I, the, the the success we had when I was there was a direct correlation to how good our players were is you know he shows show me a coach with a good record i'll show you guys got a bunch of talented football players on the team and that's what we had so um but i learned a ton not only from the coaches there but from the players i had an opportunity to coach this is a question where the answer ended up going a little bit of a different place than you might expect just based on the question itself but he was asked to compare his experiences coaching at oregon and ohio state yeah, nothing goes through my mind. And I don't mean it that way because I, I never think of that. Like I learned a long time ago, I think it was Thomas Jefferson, that comparison is a thief of joy. And, and I don't compare my experience at one school to my experience at another school because number one, I don't have time to do that. But number two, um, maybe when I retire, I can sit back and kind of think about it. But I, I don't really think about it. I just think of it. Uh, this game has given me so much and it's been so special that I've had an opportunity, you know, I got a chance to coach at Oregon. Like I, I would have never dreamed of that as a little kid. I got a chance to coach at the Ohio state. Like, wow. I mean, that's, that's pretty special. So I think both of them are, are, are different. I think every experience is different just because all universities and the people that you deal with are different, but um, both places are really special to me though. All right. So Kelly didn't want to make a big comparison there, but is he, is he at least excited to go back to I am. I love my time there. I mean, it was, and I met so many great people, you know, besides the coaches and the players that I got a chance to coach, the Phil and Penny Knights and the Pat Kilkenny's and Stephanie Kilkenny's and Ed Melitis and, and so many people that care very deeply about that university. That's the one thing I can tell you about being there is the passion that those guys have for the University of Oregon is, is second to none. Just like the people here, their passion for this place is second to none. So I think I, I, there aren't many people that got a chance to, to coach at both places. And I, I just feel very fortunate that I, I could. So talked earlier about the connection between Ryan day and chip Kelly and the different dynamics of their friendship over E over the years. But what kind of an influence has chip Kelly had on Ryan day's career? What was it that he saw from him so early that made him think that Ryan day was going to be a good coach? I think it, he just had a, he's always had a really keen athletic mind. You know, he could process things really fast. Um, you know, he was the catcher on the baseball team, the point guard on the basketball team, the quarterback of the football team. You know, always the guy that had to make decisions while he was a player. So I thought he naturally would transition into being a very good coach. And then just getting a chance to observe him early in his career, you knew, you know, that guy has it. You know, and I think he, I knew he had a bright, bright future. And, and his success wasn't a surprise, but his success wasn't a surprise to anybody that's ever been around him for a while, just because you can tell how he's wired, like he's wired to be successful in, in uh, what he's doing right now. You know, I think it's, it's to some people, I don't know, maybe they don't know him as well as we do, but it's, it's not a surprise to us because I think he's, we knew he was going to be successful from a really, really young age. Those two guys are both New Hampshire guys. 
Another high-profile college football coach, Dan Mullen, former coach at Mississippi State in Florida, he's also a New Hampshire guy. How does he figure into the dynamics between Day and Kelly? We're all from the same hometown, so I think we all grew up within a mile of each other. So it's, um, I helped Danny get his first job. Sean McDonald, who was at, who was a teacher at our hometown, that went on to coach college and was a head coach at New Hampshire and coached both myself and Ryan, kind of got me involved. I got Danny involved. Danny. Ryan, when Ryan got to Florida, it's because I called Danny because Danny was a, was at Florida at the time and said he was at Boston College and the job came open. So I recommended him to Danny and it kind of went from there. But I, I think it's about who you know sometimes more than what you know. And I think all he never, all Ryan ever needed to do was get in front of some people. So if we could open a door to get him in front of people, we didn't get him any jobs. He got the jobs himself, but it was just an opportunity after people met him. They were like, yeah, you know, I wouldn't have recommended him if I didn't think he could do a really good job at it. And I knew he would be successful. What does Chip Kelly remember about the first time he had Ryan Day as his quarterback in a big game like this? And what was Ryan Day's demeanor like during that game? You're going to hear that answer. And then a quick follow-up from Stephen Means of Cleveland.com. Yeah, I, I think it was very similar. So he started, you know, right at the beginning. I think we opened up against Rhode Island and he played really well in that opening game. But he was, he was, he's the same as he is now. He was very well prepared. You know, he, he knew what he was facing and knew who he was facing and and studied it. Any advantage he could get from his preparation, he would take advantage of. And and then he was just always just so competitive in every situation that, you know, the great thing about him is you never had to motivate him. You didn't have to say, hey, you got to get up. It's a Tuesday practice. And this is who we had. He was he was already like that, you know, because he's such an, an intrinsically motivated person that, you know, those are the guys that you love coaching because they have to spend a lot of time on things that, on X and O's because he's already dialed in that way. How much of that actually comes with experience versus a guy just, as you're explaining with, with Ryan, that guy's just kind of built for a moment, regardless of how much experience he does or doesn't have? I think the experience helps you, but I do think there are some people that are built for the moment, and I've always felt that he was one of those guys. Dan Lanning is not the defensive coordinator for the Oregon Ducks. That would be Tosh Lupoi, but it is still undoubtedly a Dan Lanning defense that the Ducks are running this year. So what makes a D- Dan Lanning defense a Dan Lanning defense? I only faced him one other time, so I, I haven't studied Dan to be able to say this was his hallmark traits of this. And then, it, and it was two years ago because we didn't play him in 23, so I only played him in 22, and that was the first time he faced him. So, um, But I, I think there's movement involved in the front. You know, they, they move in and out of three down and four down. Um, they can blitz you for internally. They can blitz you from the edges. Um, and I think they're always seemed to like they're close in coverage. Like there's, there's not, a, you don't turn the tape on and see a lot of guys running free. You know, I think they do a really good job of mixing their coverages with their fronts. Um, and it, it can present some problems to you if you're not prepared for it. So, you know, that's the challenge for us this week is that it's a really well coordinated defense, both on the front end and on the back end. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Chip Kelly had some really fun and interesting things to say during the course of that interview. And obviously it seems, seemed like he was pretty loose, pretty relaxed, might be feeling pretty good about his chances this weekend as the Buckeyes head west to face the Oregon Ducks Saturday night, 7.30 p.m. on NBC. Should be an absolute banger of a game. Number two versus number three, probably more or less settling one of the spots in the Big Ten championship game unless something really goes crazy after that. Could be more or less a college football playoff play-in game in certain ways as well. So a lot on the line this weekend. Bucks and Ducks, Saturday night, we will be there. We're actually headed out on Thursday. Tony, Kevin, and I out there covering the game. We'll be out there for an an extra day on the front end of the trip to give you a little extra coverage live from Oregon. We will be out there for several days, including a full day on Sunday afterwards to recap everything that we saw and everything that we learned. It's going to be a great weekend, a very exciting weekend, and a great time to be a member of BuckeyeHuddle.com. We're going to have tons of coverage all weekend long, including a prob- what promises to be a very active week on the Huddle Board presented by Jeff Ruby's Columbus. That's all at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Also, make sure you check us out at YouTube.com slash BuckeyeHuddle. We'll have our full weekend of coverage, all the stuff you've come to know and expect from us, plus much, much more. It's going to be a very busy, very content-filled weekend at youtube.com slash buckeyehuddle and buckeyehuddle.com. That will do it for now. We'll be back with another bonus episode a little later on.